Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. So, um, some of you may have developed an idea that semester is over, there are boring and necessary mathematical tools that no one needs, and I will just pay my time to the class, but you will do nothing and it will be fine to finish. I just imagine myself in, in the class for what I was doing as an undergraduate. But <coughs> I invite you to wake up today. Uh, well, you do not need to do it every, every time because for, 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 for a reason. Last, about three weeks, we did a lot of uh, mathematical rigor and details for harmonic oscillator, which is a little above of minimal uh, necessary things. I hope it uh, leaves some positive impressions, skills and traces in your memories for next things and maybe for, for someone it will be helpful for scientific career or educational career. But what we are going to do today, we are returning back to the very basic level. And uh, what we will do today will belong uh, uh, to the um, two-dimensional two rotations. We will return back to Bohr's model. If you are uh, planning to pursue a career in uh, teaching, this is some minimal amount of information that is typically exposed to uh, like uh, school kids or uh, college students. So and. I was thinking, I, I, I should admit, I, I wasn't preparing as deep as I, as I should, but I was just thinking what to tell. And I found a characterization of today's meeting. It is a fairy tale for adults. Mm -hmm. So by the level of ma mathematical rigor, it will be something really easy. So I, I guarantee this 200% that each of you can stand up, just go over slides without preparation and explain each step. So my role is very auxiliary, just to flip the slides. But behind uh, this simple derivation, there will be um, deep fundamental ideas that are applied again and again in uh, more advanced topics. So if we need to get these ideas, we do not need to torture ourselves with uh, complicated mathematical uh, things. So the I will start... Um, from the beginning in a few seconds, but just giving heads up, the, there will be well several concepts. One of them is transition from rectangular to curvilinear coordinates. Um, this is part of calculus three in different colleges. It is different, and um, this is like differential geometry, non-Euclidean spaces. Um, we do not go, get so deep. We will touch only polar coordinates that you already know. But this idea about polar and later spherical coordinates is uh, belongs to like core minimal knowledge of uh, human kind, human society, because the simplest practically useful problem, hydrogen atom, cannot be solved mathematically without this concept of curvilinear coordinates. I do not believe that we will have time uh, until the end of semester to study step by step uh, for solutions of hydrogen atom. I will just declare them for the lack of time. But the fundamental concept that is behind will be part of today's meeting. And I will uh, like attract your attention and show a special sign. Like, wake up twice, look here. Uh, another concept, you are already aware of degeneracy, right? We talked about it when there was a multi-dimensional boxes, right? Like three-dimensional, two-dimensional. There are several states which have uh, the same energy, but they different quantum states. In our 
the problem today will show another example of, of this degenerative concept. And uh, it will appeal to your uh, fundamental background knowledge about uh, like hydrogen atom when uh, there are three p orbitals which have uh, the same energy, right? 5d orbitals. So something in uh, today's material will uh, focus our attention to the concepts behind it. Curvilinear coordinates. And there will be a promise of connection to experiment. I will not fulfill this promise today. We will probably postpone to the, to the next meeting, but I will pave a way of, uh, of connecting between rotations and the <coughs> true experiment that can be done. Maybe you will be doing this experiment in uh, PKM labs next semester. Uh, well, let's talk about projects and uh, the evening. Just yeah, even. So a little promise of if your resources of internal resources of alertness are limited, keep relaxing. I'll give a sign when it will be really important. This is yet on the like motivation. So if you look into Wikipedia on rotation spectroscopy or any text related to rotation spectroscopy, you will see a comp, a spectrum that looks like two pounds with um, peaks at the equal distance but different intensity. And uh, it is typically what happens if you do have a diatomic molecule in vacuum and one probes it with uh, like infrared uh, spectroscopy. Just uh, looks how it is able to absorb at, at different frequencies. So the diatomic molecule can oscillate because it is oscillator around the room, and in addition, it rotates, right? Surprise, surprise. Quantum features are exhibited for electrons that come close or far from uh, positively charged nuclei. No problem. Quantum properties are manifested when two nuclei oscillate. We also look at this idea for the last three weeks. And today's surprise is that if an object rotates, just, you know, if you take a plate and try to smash it into the wall, while it rotates, it may exhibit quantum properties, especially if it is on the angstrom size. And uh, if anything is, has quantum properties, means that energy states are quantized. And if you look for spectroscopy, there are transitions between these levels. So the idea that we will develop concepts to understand is that this is u equals zero absence of oscillations. So it's the um, oscillatory degree of freedom of the atomic molecule is in the ground state. This series of states is when it is in the first excitement. I wouldn't show it as, as moving uh, fist because it's it's more like two hump uh, camel. But for each of these vibrational states, there are additional substates, sublevels corresponding to rotations. Rotation of uh, atoms on diatomic molecules, even rather heavy, <coughs> much heavier than electron, it still has a quantization. And for speaking about spectra of the atomic molecules, one needs to take into account these quantum features and transitions between ground and excited and different, different sublevels. And there are some symmetries, some properties. I think this is hydrochloric acid. Um, one, one is getting 
where the symmetrical features and based on the spectral symmetries, one can discriminate analytically which diatomic molecule is in the container. If you have mix, then it will be overlapping with uh, uh, same style but at different frequencies. So if you have uh, unknown uh, products of reaction, you can identify without touching. So a little motivation connection. As well. Okay. Keep, keep sleeping. Do not focus. I'll tell when when it will be something. Oh. So this levels now I'm declaring without giving an exact solution. So it means doesn't have um, there are sub levels for vibrations, there are indices for quantum numbers. And there are uh, specific symmetries for uh, transitions between them that give this case. And um, I think we will return to this slide either by the end of uh, this meeting, which is unlikely, or in the middle of the next, of the next meeting. So um, since the sub levels for attention are offsetting from each other on uh, rather small energy values, smaller than room temperature. There is an, a new phenomenon that uh, you all are aware of for, uh, based on your um, background, education, and, and, and skills. But we never pronounced it out loud in this class. So if a system it doesn't need necessarily to be quantum, but a special quantum system. He is left alone, isolated, zero kill. It will stay in the quantum state in which we prepare it forever. Ground, if it is in ground state, it will be in ground state. We prepare and excite it, it will be an excited. This is somewhat light because uh, nothing is isolated. But if we are narrow followers of the paradigm of like, uh, Statements, postulates of quantum theory is it should be this way. Nothing is, is isolated. Nothing is at zero Kelvin. Typically, any object is at room temperature, or if you want to have it a little cooler, it's a little bit nitrogen temperature, which is also not at an absolute zero. And there is a phenomenon that is too hard for us to process mathemat mathematically right now, we will just accept the phenomenology of that. Through different motion and different degrees of freedom, there is a thermal excitation from ground to excited. Not 100%, a small probability, maybe 1%, 5%. So there is a thermal distribution. If there are several levels, the lowest one is occupied at most. Next, you'll be a little less, right? And uh, in order to reproduce this comp looking uh, spectra for rotational spectroscopy, one needs to take into account that several rotational sublevels are occupied. And they are occupied according to our uh, distribution. Right now, it's not our main focus. I'll try to briefly cover it after the, there are several things and they need to arrange it. The main goal is to get the spectrum and ideas behind it. The exact reproduction spectrum is not a goal of this class. But we will try to move in this direction. When you will be dealing with uh, PKM2 maximum, Equations like this, using Boltzmann distribution, non-zero temperature, and plugging in energies that are obtained from, from quantum theory will be a substantial part of the next semester. So just giving you a little heads up and considerations like, like this one will be repeated again and again. And this calm structure gets, uh, because of, there is a degeneracy which 
grows and there is a uh, energy in the negative exponential, there will be destructive trends. One to grow, one to change, another to drop. Right? You have these two wings going up and going down. Okay, I think this is um, a goal that uh, I want to achieve through, through this consideration. If we get to the slide uh, today, I will be happy. If not, it, it will be normal. So, through our consideration, we will get an idea that um, rotations can happen in uh, different directions, clockwise and counterclockwise. Okay. It's not a big surprise. Rotations can happen with different uh, angular speed. But this uh, value of angular speed will be context. Positive and negative. Depending on the angular speed, the energy will be growing, approximately quadratic. And the higher the speed of rotation, the higher the energy. Plus, for specific absolute value of this rotation, there will be several states with the same energy, but they will, be, they will have different uh, quantum numbers. So there will be degenerate. Several states, degeneracy numbers. And if this information is plugged in, this, uh, offsets between states into typical expression for spectra, and I need to spend time on uh, introducing this equation as well, which is another concept. Then one will be able to get this count. So, uh, rotation of quantum number, energy, degeneracy, uh, and offsets. Okay, now we uh, actually start the meeting. And it is recommended to wake up at the like orange level, not, not yet to the red. Um, for Amelia, it is uh, next couple of slides are critical. It's basically your 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 project. So the concept of quantized rotations is applied to a range of objects either to diatomic molecules that are rotating, or just electron in the hydrogen net or in any other atom, right? We are oversimplifying this problem and looking through the rotation in one plane. Because in our um, common sense, Rotations of two objects uh, happening in one plane, like planetary systems, Earth around Sun, or Moon around Earth. So it's like uh, everything in plane. In quantum world, there are deviations from this. And we will consider them later. Now let's just follow this planetary model for simplicity. Otherwise, we just throw all off the head. So, Electron, nuclei, distance, angle. Right? I don't know how to introduce it better. Just dry definitions. Now, we get used, it's, it's our custom to quantify motion by the length of trajectory, odometer. If I have, uh, well, I do not have it, but some uh, of colleagues and students have this uh, wrist uh, 
devices that count how many steps you do, or how many miles you went through. So trajectory in the length units. Can we use this concept of length units for rotational motion? We can. So you can just walk, use this stick then, that walks together with electron on the uh, this circumference on this on this uh, arc uh, trajectory. And then if you start from zero angle, as far as we go to, to this point, we can measure the arc length of this trajectory. If the this arc length is, uh, if the angle is small, arc length is small, how can we find it? What, what is uh, this length if you know the distance and the angle? Do not look, the, the answer there is already with approximation. Just use your common sense and notion of Pythagorean theorem. Huh? If 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 if, if uh, we have the rectangular triangle, we have uh, two short things and one long, and we know know this distance, and we want the, to to know the side that is opposite to the angle. Sine. So uh, r times sine phi. But if uh, we take Taylor expansion of sine. And uh, you all were taking some calculus. One, two. So Taylor expansion of sine is x minus x cubed over three and blah blah blah. The first term is x. And if the angle is small, then sine phi is replaced just by phi. So if it is infinitesimal angle. And this is infinitesimal uh, side of a triangle. Then the side instead of uh, side will be equal r times uh, d phi. Instead of sine, it is just phi. So infinitesimal. Is okay. And from. Um, Common sense without any differential tricks. What is the length of the of the full circle? E of the radius r. Two pi r. If it is less than full, then it is r times angle, or angles in, in, in the radius. But if you take this uh, connection between infinitesimal arc lengths and uh, the angle, then we can divide both both sides by the arc length. So d phi over d l will be 1 over r. Right? Truth. No cheesy truth. Be careful. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to lie, I'm not intending to do errors, but uh, just if you find some. Suppose that we have two dimensional motion so that electron can be located anywhere on the plane at any distance and at any angle. And wave function will depend on this theorem. And suppose that by some reason we need the derivative of the function over, over this length. Because the length, the distance, is the only thing we, we know how to do this. So we apply uh, rules for differentiation of the function of two arguments, bringing the two terms, and then there is a chain, right? So we take derivative over uh, this variable, and then we Make the ratio of the variable function depends on and, and this arc length for which we, we find, right? This is a um, permitted trick because if you cancel dr here and there, it will be d psi over dl, right? 
And here we do the same trick. So uh, we need deep side over DL, but we put it as deep side over angle, and then angle over over length. Now let's do an approximation for time, not forever. That we forbid our electron to depart from the orbit, that it will stay on a certain distance. This is not quite correct, but it is, uh, it will be legitimate to get the concepts. Because otherwise, it will be, you will just buried under mathematical equation. So suppose that. Distance doesn't change. Then derivative of psi over uh, distance increments will be zero. Then we will have only this this term. And then derivative over arc length will be equal to derivative over angle with this uh, metric coefficient one over r. So now please wake up and uh, observe the concept. Well, uh, the same concept is uh, it's one of the major concepts of uh, multi-dimensional calculus of differential geometry when you transfer between different system of coordinates especially from rectangular to linear then derivatives are obtaining like metric of uh, functions metric elements in front of derivative of, over other variables why it is important? Why this concept is mathematically fruitful? One cannot solve uh, for hydrogen atom without it. And another thing, the derivatives are typically entered into Hamiltonian when we do quantum theory. And if we follow this way, then the Hamiltonian differential Schrodinger equation that we need to solve we will include it in two additional terms. That brings math on the, on the next term. The, this trick, this transition between different system of coordinates, will be responsible for competition between centrifugal and centripetal forces. If you like uh, uh, read the Biblical story about Goliath and, and David. There is a, uh, this uh, device to throw things far, far away in the arm you put mass. So, uh, or when you just put something on the rope and try to rotate, there is uh, one force makes it to depart, another force on the rope makes it to, to keep. So, this transition between uh, differential operators will be responsible for, for this uh, effect later on. Okay, you can take a nap from important part of One important uh, part is done. Please. Give me signs in form of raised uh, hands if you are taking any any level of physics at college. Uh, please give me the same sign if you were exposed to the concept of angular momentum anywhere except this course. Okay. So I will not uh, question you, I will just repeat, but having in mind that it is not a not new thing for you. So if um, an object rotates on the circle at a distance r with momentum p, then it, it, this motion is described as angular momentum, which is a vector up, uh, outside of this plane. Right? And there, um, one uses the uh, cross product in quick sum, right? So basically, it is what, what, we are, what we are making. And in case all angles are uh, rectangular, if momentum is perpendicular to uh, position vector, and angular momentum is perpendicular to other two, then absolute value of the angular momentum is just product 
distance and moment. If they are at angle, then there will be a sign between them. If they are um, oriented in space, there will be like metrics for cross border. But now we don't. So let's open this simple expression with all deep knowledge that we had from previous slide. Distance is distance, we can explain. But momentum is what is normal according to two material that you were chewing through several times in this course. Huh? Um, it's, it's more like a transition between velocity and momentum, but in terms of quantum theory, which form of momentum is plugged into Hamiltonian? Differential. And you, right now you do not need to think. You can just read. How do we define the momentum operator? Yes, as derivative over, over position, derivative over that, right? Yes, uh, imaginary unit and unconstant. If our, instead of x, instead of distance, we have arc length, it will be derivative over L arc length. No cheesy things. Pure logic. Now let's plug this uh, red ugly calligraphy into here. So instead of minus i h bar and derivative over arc length. Okay? But derivative over arc length is same as derivative over angle phi. Divided by this uh, multiplied by this metric coefficient because of transition between rectangular and curvilinear system of coordinates. Good. <sighs> Excellent. And now we can with uh, calm mind and pure heart cancel the arc here. So our journey into curvilinear uh, universe kind of stops here. You just got expo exposure to the main concept, and for this problem, the mathematical complications will be behind. But be alert, either in the, at the end of this course or maybe in, in other courses when someone decides to go over hydrogen atom in details, this trick of going between rectangular and curvy linear will be repeated, and it will be much more complicated than here. It will be not just this stuff, it will be other stuff. So, projection of angular momentum onto z axis is minus i h bar derivative over angle. This is a big joke. If momentum is uh, angular momentum is so simple, there is a hope that. Solutions to triangular equation in any path will be simple as well. Just because of uh, oversimplified model. It's, it's rare in uh, So, if we need to describe quantum aspects of rotation, we may want to quantify measure of motion with angular momentum rather than linear momentum. But on the other hand, if you do want to play this game of operators, can we do an instance? We need to express observable in terms of differential operators. And for differential operator corresponding to uh, angular momentum, which is measure of circular motion. The expression is uh, as simple as possible. Operator uh, is variable corresponding to measure of circular motion, and quantum operator corresponding to this variable is very simple. By functional form, it is the same as linear momentum in Cartesian Euclidean space. Okay.
So, next step. Next step. Suppose we want to do one thing. The simplest thing one can do is to solve Schrodinger equation. And to set up Schrodinger equation, one needs Hamiltonian, rate of energy. If there is no potential, there is only rotation. And by some reason, by some uh, force, uh, uh, it, it performs circular motion, and we do not consider it by which reason. When the contribution to energy because of the kinetic part of this, of this uh, motion, is kinetic energy, which is momentum squared or two mass. Suppose you do not see this, you see only this. P squared over 2m, or P is momentum corresponding to this uh, arc length. Momentum that is uh, yet Cartesian and perpendicular to radius. Good? No, I not good. P square of over 2m. No, one can multiply and divide by the same part. Problem, right? Now, on the denominator you have p squared r squared. Can we combine them as p times r? Right? And the square will be also. Good. In the denominator you have mass times uh, two mass times r squared. Good. Also no tricks, some definitions. So what is here? Up front is angular momentum squared. So, kinetic energy of rotating circle of rotating particle is angular momentum squared over mass and radius squared. Good. What we did right now uh, works also for regular uh, classical mechanics for physics without any quantum properties. If something is rotating, then there is an analogy for linear translational motion. Momentum is measure of motion, mass of measure of inertia. Like if a heavy truck bumps into a wall, it's likely to break it. If a Skater will bump into wall. Uh, maybe skater will suffer and measure of inertia. In rotational motion, same same analogy. Angular momentum is measure of motion. Mass times r squared is called inertia. Measure of inertia. How much energy you, you need to apply to stop this motion? And it is typical um, referred to as letter I. For inertia. So there is nothing new, it's just new um, notations and abbreviations which sometimes throw minds off. It's nothing complicated, we just soberly follow notations which I didn't like when it was on the other side of the world. So, and the moment of squirt or two inertions. So, if our angular momentum is derivative over angle, then kinetic energy will and uh, we take square here, square of imaginary unit will be minus one. Okay. Minus time minus time minus will be minus. Okay. Minus is cancel one stands. And then Planck constant squared to inertia. In the denominator, second derivative over angle. Please accept Hamiltonian equations. You got Hamiltonian for Bohr model. So this curvilinear motion uh, is the only variable that determine it is angle. If, if the uh, radius is fixed, it looks very much familiar to what we had in for particle in the first place. 
second derivative over independent variable with some uh, uh, constants of ten. Before it was like uh, one constant in two masses, now it's one constant in two inertials. But other than different uh, letters here and there, it is the same, which means solving it will be much more complicated. Okay. Please consider to wake up with the forage or building the concept. If you have an operator, an operator in the power M, then these two things will commute to give you. If it is x, and this will be x squared, then it will be x, 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 minus x, 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 equals 0. If it is L sub z, z projection from the momentum, if it is L z squared and L z, it will be also commuted. The Hamiltonian is composed of only squared of angular momentum. Hamiltonian commutes with uh, angular momentum squared. And since Hamiltonian is composed as LZ squared, it should also commute with uh, LZ in the first power. So we can derive the conclusion. If two operators commute, they share the same set of eigenstates. Okay? And if they share the same set of eigenstates, why should we solve the one which is more complicated? Let's solve the one which is more simple. So instead of finding eigenstates of Hamiltonian, we can find eigenstates of L sub zero period, which is uh, simple to the death, just one derivative. But because of this commutation uh, stuff, eigenstates of L z operator at the same time will be eigenstates of Hamiltonian. And also eigenstates of L z squared will be eigenstates of Hamiltonian. But it gives it fades away. To, to do simpler things first and uh, compose more complicated sets. Find a space of angular momentum projection. Believe that they are eigen states of projection. <coughs> okay, uh, important information is done. Now we will reduce the level of effort. Do not do not do this. Do not do this. Let's continue a little bit further. We still have four, four minutes. Okay, we are trying to find eigenstates of this operator minus i h bar d d phi. Our wave function psi depends on psi depends on phi. We are coming to the university to make combinations of root vectors. Psi of phi. <laughs> what else do we need? So psi of phi will be uh, eigenvalue equals to psi of phi. And no one can forbid us to divide both left and right by a bar. So that on the left we will have uh, the uh, just derivative, and on the right you will have the ratio of eigenvalue of angular momentum to the hump constant. Why do we do it? Angular momentum has a match. Like distance times momentum, which means distance times mass times uh, distance divided by 
So if you do this ratio, the result will be dimensionless. So this is our mathematical challenge. But I have no doubt that you can do it well. Although I will be happy to do it. So first derivative of unknown function is going to be unit equals unknown eigenvalue times uh, times the function. And this uh, definition of M is that by B multiplied to one thousand it will give the eigenvalue of unknown moment. <laughs> So great pleasure of solving differential equations. Derivative of a known function, a known function. Divide left and right by, by psi by a known function. Multiply left and right by uh, infinity and infinity. And on the left will be everything of a known function. On the right will be everything of the uh, independent variable. Then apply integration. Right and to right. On the left will be logarithm, right? On the right will be just angle. And then, by our favorite tradition, we place left and right parts as powers of exponentials. So e to the power of logarithm psi equals e to the power imaginary unit, this uh, eigenvalue, the dimensionless eigenvalue times n. And exponential logarithm is the function itself. And combination of root values. Psi of phi equals unknown uh, pre constant e to the power i n phi. Do you see any difference from plain wave? I don't. In mathematical sense, it's the same as a plane wave in the free space. Right? But there is a little, there is a little difference. Free space was free, and our rotations are confined. Same as particle in the box. Not exactly the same, but similar. If one in, in the particle of the box there were boundary conditions of zero at the edges, here it is a new type of boundary conditions. After making a full circle, wave function must be equal to itself. Okay, our time is up, and some of you have uh, scheduled limitations, so let's uh, stop here. But I think we got. All major concepts except uh, degeneracy. Uh, thank you for dedicating your, your time and uh, looking forward to see you on, uh, on the web tonight.